Good evening, church. Welcome back. It is so good to be a part of study three of being a true worship. I hope you have enjoyed the previous two Friday studies. We did part one, we did part two. And if you're joining for the first time, I would encourage you to visit our YouTube link. And uh, it's all there, the studies and also previous other studies that have been done. But if you want to be a part of this true worship study, please do follow part one and part two, which will be, then it will make it much more sense as we go on. And today we're going on part three. A beautiful thing, like as we, as we always talk about, we're going to learn about a name of God and its character traits. And we will look at a scripture passage as well. I hope you are ready. I hope you've got your Bible, your book, your pens, your highlighters ready to write down things and learn things about being a true worshiper. Can we pray before we start right now? Heavenly Father, we just thank you, God. We thank you for each and everyone that's watching today as well, Father. Lord, I pray as we get into this study, as we learn about who you are, what your character traits are, Father God, and as we learn what it, does it means to be a true worshiper, pray, Lord, that you will enlighten our hearts, Father God. Open our minds, Lord, to hear from you and to learn what we need to learn. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen. Amen. Okay, so today's study... We are going to learn about the name of God, which is Eher, Asher, Eher. All right? Eher, Asher, Eher. And what does it mean? It means I am that I am. Which also means I will be who I choose to be. That is a beautiful explanation of that name, isn't it? I will be who I choose to be. <laughs> isn't that amazing? That is, what, that is who God is. He chooses to be who he wants to be. Not how we want it to be, right? So, the passage which we're going to look at, for example, is Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 to 15, right? We're going to read that passage, Exodus chapter uh, 3, verses 1 to 15. All of us know this passage. We've, we've read it. We've heard it many times. But there is something we're going to learn from this passage about being a true worshiper, right? What does it mean to be a true worshiper? worshiper all right let's read i hope you've got your bibles i hope you turned your bibles to exodus chapter 3 verses 1 to 15. now moses was tending the flock of jethro his father-in-law the priest of midian and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to horeb the mountain of god next verse and the angel of the lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush so he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush does not burn? So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the land of the Egyptians and bring them up from the land to the good and the large land, to the land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites and the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me. And I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you 
and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever and this is my memorial to all generations. So you see in this passage when we see that part where God says, what, Who do I say has sent me? He says, what? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And in the Hebrew text, the word used there is a hair, Asher, a hair. Though man has referred to God in many words, many names, Jehovah Jireh, Adonai, El Shaddai, and many other such names, this is the first time that Almighty God introduces, introduces his very own personal name. You know, Ahir, Asher, Ahir is such a holy name. Because people couldn't say that name because it was the personal name of God, that's how Yahweh came. See, the character trait we're going to look at today is the sovereignty of God. Right? So, if you look at the, the background, the backdrop to this story, this part of the passage, or all of us know Moses. Moses is known as the deliverer, isn't he? You ask what's the first thing you talk about Moses and you talk about the deliverer parting the Red Sea. So many things, isn't it? See, Moses' life of 120 years is seen divided into three seasons. There were three seasons in Moses' life. The first 40 years of his life, he was spent in Egypt, living the life of a prince. The next 40 years, we see him living as a shepherd in the land of Midian where he got married, settled down, and tending his father-in-law's flock. The final 40 years of his life, Moses is seen as a deliverer of Israel, bringing them out, out of the house of bondage in Egypt. From being a prince in Egypt, God had humbled Moses so much that he didn't even, flag, he didn't, he didn't even have a flock of his own. He was actually tending his father-in-law's flock. Right, But one day while he was tending his father-in-law's flock on the mountain of God near Horeb, an angel of the Lord appeared to him from the flame of fire in the midst of the bush. See, the odd thing that caught Moses' eyes was what? The attention was, even though there was a flame in the bush, the bush did not consume the fire. The bush hadn't caught fire. That was definitely something unusual. So that's why as Moses drew near, he heard the voice of God calling out to him. And he had the most amazing encounter with God. See, who is this God? We've been studying about the different names of God, his character traits, the, and certain things of what he expects us. See, if we look at Revelations 1 verse 8. What does it say in Revelations 1 verse 8? It talks about, beautifully, the sovereignty of God. Revelations 1 verse 8 is the last book in the Bible. It says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Isn't that a beautiful verse? If you were have a highlight. I want you to mark that verse. That is such a beautiful verse. He is who? Who is? Who was? And who is to come. There is no one else like him. <clears throat> so going back to our passage in Exodus chapter 3. I hope you have a hand to turn back to Exodus chapter 3 verses 1 to 15. That is going to be our study text for today. Right? 
So we can see that Moses had received sufficient training as a shepherd in tending his father-in-law's flock before he received his holy calling from God to be a, a shepherd and a deliverer. He was both a shepherd and a deliverer for the people of Israel. At Horeb, which was known as the mountain of God, Moses had his first encounter with the sovereign God. His first encounter he had with the sovereign God. If we refer to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 7, can we have a, keep a hand on Exodus? We're going to come back to that. I want to go to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 7. Another beautiful verse there. I want to, I want to tie in, link in something for you. It says, and, the, and of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Okay, the key word in that is flame of fire. Because that is something that we saw that happened in the Old Testament at the burning bush, isn't it? We see in that, in verse 2. Okay, Exodus chapter 3, verse 2, what does it say? And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a what? Flame of fire. God ministers through his angels through what? A flame of fire. So what do we understand about the angel of the Lord? Right? So when it talks about the angel of the Lord, it actually talks about Jesus himself. Right? So these, mainly these ministering angels who come to minister to us, actually make known the will of God in our lives. If you can see, what happened to Moses is, Moses' will or Moses' calling was shown to him in that burning bush. Right? Even so that the burning bush, the angel of the Lord appeared in the midst of the fire to make known God's will to Moses. Moses had been a prince in Egypt, a shepherd in Midian, and now God was calling him to commission for his divine calling. The very reason for which he was born. That is to deliver his people of Israel. You can see, you may think, no, it was such a waste. 40 years in uh, the palace as a prince. 40 years tending someone else's flock. And then he steps into his calling. What does he tell you here? You are never too old to step into what God has called you to do. Never to all. But it's very important for us to know where God has called us. See, a lot of us get mixed up as our training season. We think that is our calling and we start remaining there. Imagine if, 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 if Moses remained in his training position, if he remained in the palace or he remained in, in Midian. He said, ah, this is my calling. This is where God has placed me. God places you and takes us through seasons in life. Because he trains us. He puts us through certain things. Why? To accomplish what God has called us to do. But it is up to us to recognize our season here is over. I need to step into what God has called me to do. Most of us Christians remain where we are, remain sometimes in our training place, in our training ground, thinking that is our calling from God. So, what was the unusual thing Moses uh, noticed about the bush? We read that before and I explained it as well, didn't it? See, though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. Again, God chooses to appear in whatever form he desires. He is the sovereign God. He will be what he wants, how he wants it to be. See, sometimes it's foolish for us to have a fixed image of God and think that he should fit into our image. But he is a hair, Asher, a hair. He will be what he wants to be. We've got to understand the sovereignty of God. See, some of us Christians, we fit God into a box. He needs to be this way, this manner. This is how much... I know, and this is what I love about God, so this is where I will put my boundaries. Nothing more, nothing less. But being a true worshipper 
is coming to a place of understanding who God truly is. So have you heard this phrase, I am on fire for the Lord? I'm sure you've heard that, isn't it? People have said that many times. I am on fire for God, <laughs> right? Or you can have heard people say, he is a man on fire for God. I'm not talking about the movie, yeah, Man on Fire. Right? I'm talking about where people would talk about it as a man who like, you know, who does so many things. So what is your understanding of that statement? See, when you are ignited with the fire of the Holy Spirit, people can see the presence of Lord work in your life and they see that you are empowered. But you will not be consumed by your anointing, a very important thing. Even though you are filled with so much of power and anointing, you do not get consumed by that. Because we can say that we are on fire for the Lord. It means we are passionately ablaze for God. But the true fire and anointing of the Holy Spirit will not destroy you or work against God. You have to understand that. Your true anointing will never work against God. On the other hand, if you say you are on fire for the Lord, but things taking place through that anointing are displeasing to the Lord, then you are consumed by the darkness that is at work in you because it is not the Spirit of the Lord. Many Christians fail in this area. They get so consumed and they get so overtaken <clears throat> by the anointing and everything else what happens is their character then suddenly starts deviating and it becomes displeasing to God then you cannot call yourself as a man on fire for God so do you believe that a person who is genuinely on fire for the Lord will attract the attention of those around him yes definitely People will be drawn to his anointing and the power at work in him. However, the enemy can also cause people to be drawn towards a false anointing. If miracles are performed by such a person, you may have not heard this term, but there is an anointing called the false anointing, which starts mimicking and starts showing the, it seems to be it is of God, but not. So sometimes people get drawn to that sometimes. So it's good to decide and see, who am I following? Am I really trusting God's anointing? Or am I following a false anointing? How do you know that? How do you discern that? The Holy Spirit has to reveal it to you. The Holy Spirit has to show it to you. See, this is where as Christians we have to be very careful whom we follow, whom we believe, right? What type of an anointing is operating? Let's look at verse 4. So, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, see that? Very important. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. God spoke only after he decided to look. You need to look. When you see something unusual, when you know there's, an, there's, a, there's a presence of God that is unusual, and when you press into that, God will speak. See, a lot of people talk about this saying. I've heard people tell. The question here is, did Moses hear it audibly or was it spiritually, in his spirit? Did he hear it in his spirit or did he hear it audibly? What do you think? Yes, it was audible. God's voice in this part, it was very audible it was heard audibly he didn't hear it in his spirit he heard it audibly when the voice of god spoke why do you suppose moses did not reply asking who is this or who are you 
imagine suddenly you hear a bush and he suddenly talks to you, right? It's on fire. Right? There are they he's not hallucinating, huh? being in this desert, he's not seeing things. But he sees this and he hears then his name being called out from the bush. And why do you think he asked, hey, who is this? See, Moses had already known about Almighty God and his people all his life. He had developed a strong relationship with God and knew his voice even in his spirit. Therefore, when God spoke to him with such authority, Moses did not even have to ask who it was that spoke to him. He knew he was the creator God. He just knew it. In his spirit, bang, he knew it. This is God, no one else. Isn't that amazing? See, it, 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 it's a good question to ask ourselves. Have we developed a close enough relationship with God to recognize his voice when he calls us, speaks to us? Or do we wonder whether I'm possessed or I'm hearing other voices? See, the ability to hear and recognize the voice of God in our inner man depends on how well we have developed a relationship with Him. Failure to develop a bond can cause doubts in our mind. And we may not be able to distinguish between God's voice, the enemy's voice, and our own imagination. There are three things that are at work. God's voice, the enemy's voice, and our own imagination see if you have a relationship you know for i mean i've been married for 14 plus years with my wife and the moment she rings even if she calls from another number the moment i hear her voice i know it is her she didn't have to say this is me talking for example if sean calls me i know it is sean but if some random person suddenly calls me who i have met once spoken to once calls me I'm, and they talk as if they know me so well. And they're asking some help. And I will think, who is this? And they'll say, I'm so and so. You know, I met you here. You remember you gave me your number. And you're like thinking, going way back. Ah, yes, yes, yes. They know me. But I don't know them. Because why? We haven't communicated much. The more we communicate with people over the phone or when we talk and meet, what happens? Their voice is so recognizable. They can call from a very unknown number. As long as you hear their voice, you know who's speaking on the other end. That is the relationship God is calling us to be in. That is how we will know this is God that is talking to me because I can recognize his voice. See a beautiful verse in John chapter 10. It talks about John chapter 10, verses 27, you know, onwards it reads, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Yeah, so verse seven, 27 is the main thing. My sheep hear my voice. So are we God's sheep? Then we need to know his voice. Let's look at verse 5, Exodus chapter 3, verse 5. What does it say? And he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. So there are two instructions that Moses got. Number one, do not draw near this place. That means do not come any closer. Number two, take your sandals off the feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground two instructions and it was so beautiful you know how and you know for me i it got me thinking see sometimes when i go into my private prayer time or at worship or when if you go into your private prayer time and worship do you remove your slippers off out of reverence before approaching god Have you trained yourself to recognize that when you stand before God, you are actually standing on holy ground? 
See, it's not something compulsory and you're not going to be judged if you don't do it, right? It's not that. But it's a point where you come to a point of recognizing that he is a holy God. And the reverence you have for him, the respect you have for him. Why is it sometimes you, I don't know, when we go into certain houses, we remove our slippers out and we walk in. Why? Because we know we walked and talked and that house looks so beautiful, nicely kept. If you have muddy shoes, if it is your own home, sometimes you walk and you get a thundering shot from your mother then. But when we go into someone else's house who we respect a lot, we remove our food. Why? Because we know it's a clean place. Right? So see, sometimes, I don't know about you, I hope you have a little place for your quiet time. In your house, you know, you don't have to have a big house. You don't have to have to have. You may not say, I don't have a separate room to have for my prayer room. I don't have a separate room for my prayer room. I have three kids. You can imagine how my house is. The only spot I have is one corner of my couch. That is it. That is my quiet spot with God. I can't walk into the play. If I walk into her, my kid's room, I walk into the playroom, I'll trample on some toy that will start squeaking. So my place, my private time with God in my morning is my little couch where I sit in that corner. And I kneel there before that. I just kneel there. As soon as I get there, first and foremost, I just kneel down on my couch and I just thank God for today. I hope you have a place, a sacred place, an altar where you have built for God in your house. Or it's just anywhere and everywhere. Is it? Sometimes we get so laid back in our Christian life that it's like, you know what? I read. I, I remember one of my friends used to say, I read my Bible, you know, when I'm in the bathroom because that's the only time I have peace and quietness. And I'm like, man, what a place to read your Bible. Doing what? The moment something is exiting, something is entering in. But you know, since most of my family, my cousins and all are Hindus, you know, I've been to their houses. And they don't have massive houses, you know, but they'll have a, a certain place where they'll have this God. And you know, we, will, we were never, even when we were young, when I used to go to my cousin's house to play, we were never able to play near that area. We could never go with slippers to that area. We always had to remove our slippers when we go near that area. That was blocked off. Even for hide and seek, we can't go and hide behind that statue. We get scolded. Even though we've done it many times, I, me and my cousin brother have got scolded many times. Because they treat that as holy and they reverence. So imagine earthly people giving so much reverence to a false and a man-made God, us as Christians who serve and worship the living God, it's a good thing to question ourselves, where is our reverence? If they know how to give reverence to their false God, man, how much more should we do for a living God? A sovereign God. It's a good thing to question ourselves. There's something which I questioned, which I, I learned, you know, and I realized it. See, that's why even in, in day one, when we learned the seraphims, why they covered their feet and they covered their faces. He is an holy God. See, It will be a good thing sometimes, you know, when, you, when you, you have to be convicted, don't do it because I tell you, don't do it as if, oh, God is going to hate me because I don't do it. No, this is not God. That is not him. He loves you. That's true. That won't change. That's his love. But it's up to you when you get convicted in your spirit and say, hey, you know what, today I really feel I want to give God reverence. I want to worship him for who he really is. Understanding the sovereignty of God. There are times, you know, uh, I, 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 I remove my slippers and I, you know, I stand. 
I know. I feel it in my spirit. His presence is there. And the more, I, more reverence I give, the more it pleases the heart of God. That is what a true worshiper is understanding the heart of God. Let's look at verse 6. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. So when God first introduced himself to Moses, he said he was the God of Moses' father and the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. So Moses' father, Amram, was from the tribe of Levi, one of Jacob's sons. This tells us something about a chosen bloodline. Can you see how Moses came? See, Amran was from the son, from the tribe of Levi. <clears throat> so God is very serious about raising a godly bloodline. Because he wants us to worship him from one generation to another. What we do has to go down our generation. It should never stop with you. The relationship you have with God, have you instilled that into your children? Have they seen that and said, you know what, I want to be like that. I want to be like mama. The way she gets up in the morning and prays. The way she goes to bed when she prays and commits things to God. I want to be like that. Or do they say, oh man, I want to be far away from this type of thing. Because we got to instill that into our children. Because why? Bringing up a godly generation is very important. See, I always tell parents as well. You cannot expect a pastor to change a child's life like that over a, over a click of a button. Change will come when the child sees change at home. When she sees or he or she sees parents doing things in godly in a godly manner that is what will change them when they see you praying in the morning getting up disciplining yourself and when they see change happen they know hey mama's god is amazing or dada's god is amazing look what he or she is doing i want to get up in the morning and pray I want to pray loud like that. I want to kneel down and pray. And certain principles, they start learning from what atmosphere you set at home. It's very important. See, it, that is why God does not approve us of being unequally yoked with unbelievers. Because His standard is what would be for people to say, as for me and my house, we will worship and serve the Lord. If you are yoked with an unbeliever, you can never say that statement. That's why God does not entertain or agree of being unequally yoked. Doesn't matter how good lifestyle he has, he may be living like a Christian, but if he hasn't accepted Jesus as his personal savior, that is being unequally yoked. And you can never say, because God wants us to have that godly generation where we can say, as for me and my house, we will worship and serve the Lord. See, when Moses heard the voice, what did he say? He hid his face. Verse 6, it says, Moses hid his face. For he was afraid to look upon God. Just like the seraphim angels around the throne of God who covered their faces when worshipping God. Let's look at Exodus chapter 33. Let's go. Just keep your hands still on Exodus chapter 3. We're going to go further in. Exodus chapter 33 verse 11. It says, So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And he would return to the camp. But his servant Joshua of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. What do we see in this? 
there exodus chapter 3 moses hid his face from god a few chapters after that exodus chapter 3 to 33 what happened god spoke to moses face to face what changed tell me what changed did god change did the holiness of god change did his character change no who changed moses developed an intimate relationship with god from chapter 3 to chapter 33 that journey moses had an intimate relationship with god which made him able to talk to god face to face i looked at that and i said man i want that in my life if moses could do it without all the fancy church no fancy equipment no fancy anything he was in the desert leading a bunch of grumbling people no time to spend time with but he always found time to get into god's presence he built an intimate relationship with god see moses had such a close walk with god that the lord was delighted to personally reveal himself to moses instead of communicating with him through priests and prophets isn't that amazing have you desired to develop such an intimacy with the lord and ask the lord to show you how you can develop that closeness with him that should be one of our cries that should be one of our prayers lord i want to have that type of relationship with you was moses perfect no did he have faults? Uh, faults? Yes. But what was more important? The intimate relationship he had with God. Beautiful, isn't it? See, in that we can see, we can, our relationship with God, when we build that intimate relationship with God, we don't have to run from one man to another man. One man of God to another man of God. One prophet to another prophet to hear a word from God. Why? He will speak directly to you face to face. See, you and I, maybe you have been a Christian for maybe 20 years. And the moment there is an advertising, oh, this prophet of God is coming to this thing. There's going to be a massive meeting. You run, wait in line. To get prayer to hear a word from God through that man of God. Why? Can't he speak to you? Because you know why? You haven't disciplined yourself. You and have an eagerness to build an intimate relationship with God. You're too lazy. If I say it straight. It's easy to go get it from someone else. Then... Discipline yourself, change your character, build an intimate relationship with God to hear directly from him. Oh, that's too much of a process. I like the fast food. I like the two-minute noodles. I like the drive through We've all been there. I've been like that. But it took me some time to realize, hey, you know what? I don't need anyone to tell me God's purposes in my life. When I can have a direct access to God. Don't power yourself through an extension cord when you can go directly to the power itself. And you can hear from God. Always, I always tell, if a man of God speaks something over your life, it always has to be a confirmation of what God has already spoken to you. It will never be something new. It will never be something out of, oh, I never even thought of it. No. It will always be something that the Holy Spirit will always instill it in your heart. He will speak in your spirit. You will know it. And then maybe you forgot about it. You left it. And maybe three, four years after down the line, a man of God will speak the same very word back to you. See, after the past few years, what men of God have spoken over my life and told me certain things. I know because why? It, has all, it is always a confirmation of what God has already spoken to me. I remember a beautiful thing once when God spoke to me. 
and God gave me, and it was a little green color book which I had. And God, and I in that green color book, I had listed out the calling God had for my life. This was about maybe six years, seven years ago. I listed out what God called me to do and all those certain things. You know, I closed it, I left it, and then after that, I really way later, I forgot about it. And, you know, I was going into what God has called me to, but the details of it. And I remember one day at, at a retreat uh, where we had with my previous church, when Pastor Raja came and he prayed over me. And when he prayed over me, he said, Timothy, there is a green color book. Go and refer that book. God has written everything what you need to do in that book. And the moment he said that, my mind, I knew exactly what he was talking about. And I went to him, I looked back and I found that book. And you see, it was not new. It was something always confirmed what God has already spoken about. And it's amazing how God speaks. God will use men of God to speak into your life. It's not that he won't. But don't cling on to that only. Don't expect that only. Church, I'm encouraging you. Invest time to building an intimate relationship with God. Because when you do that, you will not be swayed from here to that way. You will never lose your path. Man will fail you, but God will never fail you. You fix your eyes on a man, the moment he fails, you will also fall. But if you fix your eyes on God, he will never fail you. You will never fall, even though if man falls. It's not easy. It's, not, it's a, it's, it's a time-consuming, it's a, it's a discipline you have to go through. That is why discipleship is necessary. It's a discipline we go through. That's why I went through three years of discipleship. Stutter, strenuous study. Strenuous sitting at God's feet. Studying, 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 studying. Hearing from God. Listening to Him. Learning. Preferring. Three years. It was not easy. It's hard. I had to discipline myself. I have a person who doesn't like to read books and study. But I had to go through it to where I want to be right now. I had to go through it because I wanted to build. I, mean, I, had, I had a desire in my heart. I want to build that intimate relationship with God. He is mine. I am his. That is what I wanted. So desire that, desire to be, have an intimate relationship with God. Let's read verse 7 to 10. Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 to 10. We can see in this, if we read on, due to time, if we read on, we can see God talks about the oppression of the people we're going through. <clears throat> see, <clears throat> after having introduced himself, God did not consider how shaken up Moses would be or what would be running through his mind. Instead, he directly gets down to business about what Moses needs to do. When God asks you to serve him and commissions you to step into your calling, does he wait for you to sort out your life out first and first take, take care of all your problems and home environment? <clears throat> for Moses, he didn't expect him to sort out it. He said, no, go, I will be with you. When God commissions us and calls us, we should be able to step out. Because, see, he expects a positive response from us when he commissions us to carry out his orders. Our right response is an act of worship to the God who is sovereign. The way we respond to what he asks us to do is our act of worship to him. But if we say, you know, Lord, wait, 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 just a few more minutes, you know, a few more years, I need to sort out this, I need to settle this, I need to build my house, I need to find this and I need to get this thing all sorted. After I get all this, Lord, like Moses, when he was 80, I will start serving you. By the time you are 80 and by the time you step into serving God, the second coming of Jesus also will come. Then what are you going to do? After you've made all the money you need to make, 
after you've lived your youthful life for everything as you spent all your energy and everything doing everything for the world and then the moment ah job issue comes that issue comes you retire ah now i can serve god giving god the latter part of your life the ailing sickly body that is wearing away that is the one you want to give god to serve god then no give god your youth Give God the best years of your life. Find out what has God called you to do. Find out, Lord, is my season of training over? Wherever you are, that is your sphere of training. Don't think that is your calling. Unless God has actually spoken to you and said, this is your calling. You should know that. More than a man of God telling you that, you should know what your calling is. Where has God called you? Where has God positioned you? For how long? For what season? You need to know. Do you ask God, Lord, what is my season? What is the plan? What is my next agenda? See, when God called his first disciples, if we look at Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 20. Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 20. We see in that, and Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Wow. I love that line. They immediately, that word immediately, left their nets and followed him. Randomly. Jesus, they saw Jesus walking. They didn't know who he was. But he asked, follow me immediately. Then and there. They didn't think twice. They didn't ask, you know, give me another week. I need to fast and pray and ask God. I will go into the temple. I'll ask the rabbi to lay his hands and pray and ask another word from the Lord. No. They didn't say, I want another confirmation. I'm waiting for another confirmation. I'm waiting for God to send an angel to my house to tell me. No, they immediately. Why? They knew. Their spirit knew that this was God. They immediately left their nets. Left their nets me. They left everything that they were working for. They left their income. They left everything and followed him. Nets in that thing we're talking about their nets is their entire source of income their work their family everything they left everything they didn't ask they didn't say you know lord give me at least a day i need to sort out my family i need to go talk to them i have to talk to them i have to take another week to pray about it because my father won't understand if i go to tell him this by the time jesus would have gone somewhere else to find another two people then god is not going to wait for you you need to move with God's speed. That is being a true worshipper. Why? Because he's a hair, Asher, a hair. He does it the way he wants it to do. His ways are not our ways. See, if we look at uh, Romans 12, verse 1. Romans 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. If we have, I think, can we have NIV in that, Sean? I think it says, yes. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. What is it? Offering your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God. That is what? Saying no to your desire. That is saying no to what you want to do. But offering yourself as saying, Lord, whatever you say, I am here to do. See, when we offer our bodies to the Holy Spirit to carry out his work for, our, for the kingdom, that is considered as a true and proper worship. Responding without delay to a high and holy call of God. 
itself is an act of worship that pleases God very much. You know, a beautiful illustration one day, you know, uh, I think it's, uh, I don't know if you know Reverend Ananda Perea, who is a very good old friend for our family, family friend of ours. And, you know, something beautiful he always shared. See, when we go to God, we write down everything we want to do for God. Lord, I want to serve you in, in uh, Zambia. Lord, I want to go as a missionary here. Lord, I want to do this for you. Lord, I want to do that for you. And we say, we state down everything we want to do for God. Lord, I want to build a home for the children, for the elders and all that. And then we give it to God saying, Lord, approve this. Lord, make this real in my life. All this, I want to serve you. Lord, put your signature of approval. And you know what he used to say? He said, that is not what God wants. What God wants is an empty piece of paper with your signature on the bottom asking him to fill out what he needs you to do. And you know, that thought really stuck in my head. I'm like, imagine giving an empty piece of paper and you signing, Lord, whatever, I will do whatever that is written on this paper. Asking him to fill out. Why? He knows the plans for us. Not our plans. He knows. So it's he who needs to do it for us. So his calling. What is his work? He wants us to do. See, Moses stepped out in obedience once certain things were made clear to him. When God told him to go deliver the people, he didn't run away. He didn't start thinking, went and talked to his father-in-law, how do I do this? No, he didn't delay. He didn't doubt God. He didn't turn a deaf ear to God's call on his life. Moses didn't tell God he's unable to step into his calling because he has family responsibility. I have the, the flock I need to look after. Who's going to look after this flock if you ask me to go to Israel, to, to Egypt, to deliver the people? No, no, my father-in-law is old. I can't go. I can't leave him and go. He, I, he has given me this responsibility. I, no. He stepped out in obedience. See, when God calls us and when we step out, God sorts out everything else for us. We don't have to sort things. We don't have to be God to sort it for him. God will sort it for us. Let's look at verse 11 and 12. We come into a close. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you. And this shall be a sign to you as I have sent you. What will be a sign? That I will be with you. When you brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. See, Moses' reply shows that he did not have any confidence in himself and had no proper self-worth. He didn't see himself as someone important or great enough to handle this task. Sometimes it might be like you and me. God did not use encouraging words to tell Moses how good and wonderful he was. Neither did the Lord tell Moses that he was special and that he would be a great leader. Instead, God only told Moses that he would be with him in his calling. You've got to write that down. God will be with me in my calling. That is the only statement I need. He is the only backup I need. That is the only statement God gave Moses. That he would know that it is the Lord himself who has commissioned him. See, how does this make us understand? The difference between leaders who have a true calling and those whom God has not called. How would we know? So I wrote this down. Leaders who have been genuinely commissioned by God will make every effort to lead people to worship the living God. Those who have not been commissioned by God will lead people to idolize them and worship them. That is the way you will see the fine line drawn. True leaders of God 
will make every effort to make people worship the living God. But those who have not been commissioned by God, God, they will lead people to idolize them and worship them. They will be the center of attraction. They will be the center of attention. More than God, it is them. More than people would desire God, they will desire to be with this man, to talk to him, to hear from him, more than hearing from God. That means that man has become an idol. So how does this situation understand, help us understand good leaders who have gone bad? They will never complete their cycle of their calling. If you notice these type of leaders, they will never complete the cycle of their calling. They will either give up halfway or make the wrong turn and fall from grace. They will fall from grace. Okay, let's look at verse 13 and 14. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, they said to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. I want you, if you have your books and your, or if you have a pen, I want you to write down that name. A hair, Asher, a hair. I don't know, Sean, if you're able to put that, if you're able to type that out on the screen. E H Y E H. Asher, A S H E R, a hair. Right? A hair, Asher, a hair. It means I am that I am. E H Y E H space a s h e r space e h y e h i am that i am i want you to write that name down that is who god is that is his personal name a very holy name see if we the translation of it is yes, Asher A. Uh, it's a it's uh, A S H E R. A hair, Asher A S H E R. A S H H E R. A hair A H Y E H. And the first one also is, I think, not R, it's H, Sean. E H Y E H. Thank you so much, Sean. Sean is doing an amazing job here, huh? always is. Right? So, if you, if you write down that name, write it down in your book, in your study today. What is the study? A hair, Asher, a hair. I know, no, not like that, Sean. It's okay. Never mind. Okay. Uh, it's E H Y E H space A S H E R space E H Y E H. That is it. Yep. That is right. A hair, Asher, a hair. And what does it mean? I am that I am. That is what God told Moses. He said, What do I tell? Who do I who sent me? When I tell the people who sent you, what did God tell Moses to tell? Told him to tell this. Tell him that a hair, Asher, who has, I am who I am has sent me to you see his name means the sufficient self-sustaining god who was 
who is and who is to be, like we said, uh, read in Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. In John 8, 58, can we have John 8, 58? I don't think I gave that one yet. Is it there? Okay, John 8, 58. What does it say? John 8, 58. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So how did God refer to himself there? Before Abraham was, I am. He was there before. He is the sovereign God. So we also can see in that, the what does it tell about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Son? What does, it, what does it tell us about that? Both are the same. The Father and the Son are one. Isn't that amazing? Okay, let's go back. Oh, time is gone. Let's go back to verse 15, our last verse, and then we are done. Verse 15. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. I want you to mark that verse down. This is my name forever, not for a period, not for only the Old Testament. It is his name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations generations see how does god expect us to remember his name to remember him as the great i am remember it as the great i am see in your personal time of prayer and worship how often do you refer to god by his very own personal name how do you talk to him see it is good you know, a good practice and a beautiful act of worship to refer to our Heavenly Father as I am, since that is how He expects us to remember Him. He made His personal name known to us for a reason. When we refer to Him as such, then we are also saying that we are willing to allow Him to be sovereign in our lives and let Him be who He wants to be in our lives. As the great I am, that I am. See, it's a good thing to challenge us, church, and ask us, when we present ourselves before God, when we talk to Him, do we allow God to be who He is, the way He wants to be in our lives? Or do we want Him to be the way we want Him to be in our lives? I'm going to ask that again. Do we want, do we have a realization and do we say, God, Lord, you be who you are, the way you want to be in my life? Or are we so selfish to say, God, I want you to be like this in my life? We expect God to be the way we want him to be in our lives. That is a very selfish act of church. That is putting God into a little box. This is how we want you to be. These are your boundaries, God. I love this part about you. That's all. But our prayer has to change and say, Lord, you be a hair, Asher, a hair in my life. Be who you want to be in my life. Be that God. Be the person. Your sovereignty, Lord. The way you want to do things, Lord, you do it. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Because it means I will be who I choose to be. That is his name. The way he does things, the way he wants to do it, he will do it. Can we accept that? That is our act of true worship to God. When we come to that point of submission, when we come to that humility and that submission to God saying, Lord, you be who you want to be in my life. So today our prayer of adoration. Church, are you ready to pray and declare this in your life? 
we are going to declare this together. I want you, if you are able to, to kneel down, if you are, if you are able to remove your slippers, we're going to just get into this moment. Where we're going to declare this. And let's pray together. Let's read it together. One, two, three, go. Sovereign God, I bow before you in holy awe and declare there is no God like you. O oh, great I am that I am. May my worship ascend as a fragrant incense unto thee and give you glory. My Lord and my God in the heavens, he does all that he pleases. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And you do according to your will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can stop your hand or say to you, what have you done? Whatever the great I am pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all deeps. You, O oh Lord, have mercy on whomever you will, and, and you harden whomever you will, for you are sovereign. O Lord of hosts, you have sworn, as I have planned, so it shall be, as I have purposed, so shall it stand. No wisdom, no understanding, no counsel can avail against you, O Lord. With you, O great I am that I am, are wisdom and might. You have counsel and understanding. If you tear down, no one can rebuild. If you shut a man in, no one can open. If you withhold the waters, they dry up. If you send them out, they overwhelm the land. With you are strength and sound wisdom. They are deceived and the deceiver are in your power. So you do as you please. Praise be to your holy name. Amen. Amen and amen. So we are going to go into a time of worship, meditative worship. There's going to be a song that will be played at the end. A beautiful song talking about how beautiful God is and that you stand in awe of him. While that song is played, I want you to declare the sovereignty of God in your life. If there are certain things that you learned today which you want to put right before God, I would ask you to take time and ask God to forgive you and change certain things in your life. I want you to take this time as this song is played, let this song minister into your soul. Let it, let it bring that sense of reverence and honor for his holiness. Let it bring out that thing of saying, God, and will you declare it saying, Lord, be who you want to be in my life. Will you declare that church? If you are ready to say that, only say it. Don't say it because I'm telling you. Because you have to be ready then to allow God to be who he is, how he wants to be in your life. Not your expectation of God but who he is. If that is you, if you want to make that and say, Lord, I want to have that intimate relationship with you, God. I want to hear your voice. I want you to hear you talk to me. Even at this moment, while this worship song is played, and if that is your cry of your heart, and if you have said things right, you know what? God is going to speak to you, my child. God is going to speak to you. He will tell you what he wants to tell you. He will share with you certain things. You're going to hear his voice, which for the first time right now, I open every year, inner year, spiritual year, to hear your voice, Heavenly Father. I pray as this song is going through, I pray that your presence will fill that room, fill that hall, fill this car, whatever they're in. And Lord, that they will hear your voice and your direction in their lives, God. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen. And I will catch you again, back again next Friday for part four of being a true worship.
this King of glory. Jesus is his name. All hail the King of glory. Forever he shall reign. He came and redeemed my story. Everything has changed. All hail the King of glory.